Okay, so thanks very much to Anais and Claudia for organizing this session for accepting my paper. Um, so the first thing I would like to say is that I wish I, I would pretend to be a social anthropologist, but I'm not. I'm an archaeologist, and uh, my main uh, area of fieldwork usually is uh, Sardinia, so something similar to uh, Marielli's. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, late Neolithic rocket tombs, which, as you can see here, have a plan of quite complex architecture of different spaces. They are made in a way to look like small houses, uh, have pillars and all, and other decorations, and they are often uh, grouped together in, in cemeteries and clusters. Uh, so I, that's my main thing, but I started to be interested in the Toraja for various reasons, but the main one is that, to my knowledge, that's the only uh, living society where, I mean, this traditional society who are still doing and using rocket tombs today. So if you go there, there are lots of people still doing rocket tombs in different areas. Uh, the the Toraja are very well known ethnographically. It's been studied a lot by different people, uh, especially because they are very famous for their very uh, yeah spectacular uh, burial ceremonies where they do a lot of uh, sacrifices and killing of buffaloes. You can see here. Uh, a traditional house, a tumkanan, where you would see the, the, the stack of the horns from the sacrifice buffalo. So lots of ethnographers have been looking at this aspects of their, of their culture and of their uh, tumkanan houses as well. But very few people have actually been looking in details at the, uh, the rocket tomb. So I thought it would be nice to, to go there and to uh, have a look. Uh, just a... Uh, Again, it's a very rough introduction. So this, this rocket tombs are called Leon Fa, which means literally cut tombs. And they are grouped together in symmetries like this, in big boulders or cliffs. Uh, they are used only by the noble part of the, the society. So um, these guys, the nobles, who are also having these very monumental houses, Tonkanans. Uh, interestingly, each single tomb, which are collective tombs, uh, each single tomb is paired to a house, so they are they're working together as a kind of pair. Uh, you cannot have a tunkanan without a tomb and vice versa. And uh, yeah, and these tombs they are made by specialized artisans. Again, just to give you a rough idea of how they look like, so this is a typical uh, current or modern day tomb. Uh, they have a doorway which is usually closed afterwards by a wooden door. And it's very simple design. So it's basically a big cube of two meters and twenty centimeters exactly, because that's to a low space for coffins of two meters long. So uh, you can stack small coffins into into the chamber. Uh, so that's the, the the kind of the tomb you see that were made the last fifty years more or less. But before they were a tradition for slightly smaller tombs. So here, that's interesting. You see two the two traditions together, the smaller version which is about two meters deep but slightly smaller in terms of space okay so uh ron and myself went uh in sulawesi last year and we were mostly interested to look at uh, aspects of the landscape so how tombs and houses are kind of positioned in the landscape and how this is telling us something about the relationship between the the dead and the living, but as part of this project, we also had we were lucky to meet with uh, stone carvers, and we this is what I'm going to talk today. But we also spoke to elders who are uh, sponsoring and using these tombs, and also the uh, ritual specialists. Creating so the, the action of creating a Leon Pass so or a tomb is a very complex social process, so there's a huge social dimension behind it. There's a lot of negotiation, who has a right to be buried there and there, so it's very complex. I'm not going to discuss this. If you're interested, there's a very nice paper by the Toraja specialist Roxana Watson. Uh, but, so on this paper, I'm going just to focus on the, the materiality of the rock art construction and the different ritual aspect of it. Okay, so the, one of the first steps when you want to build a tomb is to actually reserve a spot on the surface of the cliff. And this can be made by different uh, processes. You can either carve 
at a small space which corresponds to the uh, entrance of your future tomb, or you can just paint. And that's interesting, again, when you're working in prehistoric Europe, because often in Sicily or in Sardinia, you have these kind of small openings that are not tombs, so they are interpreted as unfinished tombs, but they may be just reserved spots that have never been actually used for to build an actual tomb. Uh, then when you decide to make a new tomb, so there are different reasons, either because you build a new tomb canal or because your family uh, chamber is full, so you, that's the only way you can create a new uh, rocket tomb. Uh, there are lots of, it's like when you build a house today, you have to meet with artisans and discuss prices, so we were able to collect different uh, costs here, which I don't need to go into details, but basically if a team of artisans are working full time, they will finish this tomb in three or six months. Uh, and, but most, most of the time, a team of artisans will do different tombs in different areas, so they will, it would take more or less a year to finish uh, a monument. <coughs> uh, when the project starts, so the artisans are going to they just settle around the rock. So here you see the entrance of the new rocket tomb, and here are the artisans. And there are a lot of things going on, which is very interesting. They have uh, their workshop, but also uh, a place where they will live, uh, they have a small garden, and they have even the, uh, the bathroom. So if you think archaeologically, that's interesting because you have like settlement evidence. It's something which is just uh, provisorily, uh, yeah, house or yeah, accommodation. Uh, the artisans talking about uh, tools. So here it's different because that's obviously they are using metal, but uh, interestingly they are using different sizes for what they want to do. For the most complex, and when they need accuracy, they will use a smaller point, like especially for the entrance doorway, which is the, the more complicated, the more com uh, complex part of the building. And then for just breaking big parts of the, of the space, of big stones, they will use the, uh, the longer uh, picks. Uh, in all the different uh, areas we've been, they were always working in three workers together, so one, that there's a rota in the way they work, one is inside the chamber and just cut the stones, another one is just outside and have removing the blocks and throwing them away, and the third one is doing, is having a nap, basically, so it's just resting, so they can, basically, you have a chance to have a rest every three, every three times. Uh, so, okay, so I would like to talk about the uh, the chaîne opératoire here, the, the sequence of construction. And the thing that really struck me at the time is that the the actual process of cutting the chamber is very segmented, so we have very specific steps. And each step is marked by a very specific ritual. So you're not in a case where you create a tomb and then at the very end you have like a celebration or like a ceremony to inaugurate it. You'll have a ritual at every single step because that's a quite complex and delicate thing. So they want to, every time they've done a step into the process, they want to thank the nature for not making this failing in a way. So there will, there will be something that happen ritually. So just to go quickly, uh, it's interesting as well. Um, <coughs> Because when you yeah, think again, press returns as well, you, you could see similar things. But basically, even just before doing, uh, even before starting the cutting process, they will ask the permission to the nature. So they, they will uh, plant a branch of the combola, which is a type of plant. And if the, the branch is start to grow, it means the nature is okay. You can, you can process, but if it doesn't work, then the nature refuses you to alter it, the rock, and therefore you cannot uh, do it. Well, that's what they used to be traditionally, so I think nobody does this anymore uh, today. But the other rituals are still being practiced. Uh, so the first step is to create the doorway, which is the most complex thing, because it's, it's the nicest part of the tomb, and it's smaller as well, and it, it has all these kind of small angles as well. Uh, so when this is done, they will kill an animal, they will kill a dog or a pig. Uh, the next step is called masiku, uh, it's, it means elbow, that's because they use their arms, so here there's an interesting use of the body as a way to uh, create your architecture, so to make sure the first angle of the, 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 the chamber, here again that's a view 
that's the plan, the cross-section plan view. So that's the anterior uh, angles. They will use their elbow, and if that works, if that if they will kill a chicken or another animal. Same thing. Then they will reach the the back angle of the room, and uh, as you can see, they have the four angles, but the the walls are not very nicely finished. So that's, that's the next step, and again, that involves killing an animal. Um, yeah, many animals being killed. Uh, the Further step is to finish the sailing, and it's called uh, mabumbung. And it's also it's also a ritual you do for houses, for actual houses. When you finish a roof, you have the same ritual with the same name. So here again, there's a close parallel between houses of the dead and houses of the living. Uh, the last step is to finish the the the, the floor. So here you see the, the kind of level things, but that's the very last step of construction if you want uh, in terms of stone carving. Uh, and then they will place the wooden doorway uh, at the entrance. So here again, you kill a little animal. <laughs> and uh, yeah, interesting here at, at this tape, so it's got D22E, two, two, so the door. So we went on the side just uh, a few days after that ritual. So you see that the door was just played. They, they cut a little bit. You can see the, the remains of the wood cutting work. And then that's the remain of the of the houses of the workers, and here are the remains of the ritual, so they, they, they made a fire to cook uh, the kid animal. And the very final uh, step is to do the inauguration, which is not something you do, you don't touch the monument, but you do a ritual to consecrate it. And that's a very important ritual, um, so it's called uh, Masabu, which, and that's also a name you use for houses. Uh, we were very lucky to uh, casually attend one of these events, uh, as you can see, uh, that was very nice. So they, they just killed the pig and then cooked it and we, uh, we ate it. And it's a very important step because basically the, uh, the, the tomb before this ritual is considered as a whole, uh, local. So just like something not very uh, taboo if you want, and then after this ritual, it becomes a tomb, and therefore, it's taboo. You cannot enter it. So typically, myself, when I was doing the survey, um, I could enter many tombs. Where all people were very happy for me to en enter inside the tomb that were even finished, so as I can take measurements and so on. But after that ritual, it's it's over. Even if if a coffin would be placed in two or three years time. And one action that marks this ritual is that they would take a chicken and they would make a small incision for just to let the blood out and they would just uh, <laughs> squeeze. Uh, not squeeze, but uh, shake. <laughs> Maybe they would squeeze it. And, and then they would, uh, it's not a very good picture, but you have actually some blood on the, on the threshold here and then they would let the chicken go and apparently it's, it's, yeah, they're surviving this, so, but uh, yeah, you don't want to be uh, too sensible with animals. <laughs> And yeah, so that's what it was. So then, in the same time, a few days after, we came to uh, actually the placement of the first coffin in the, in the chamber. So there's a lot of things that is actually well studied uh, ethnographically. And, uh, and then you can take a selfie with your daughter when this is finished. OK, uh, interestingly, what we saw as well in our survey is that there were uh, some projects, some construction projects that failed or were abandoned. So uh, it's a horrible picture, but that's the only one I had, and I wanted to remember it. But it's actually a, a, a monument that was started to be made, and then a part of it just cracks, and I think it's very, very bad socially and so ritually if this happens. Uh, and other reasons is when you have a project that starts and the family runs out of money, so that ends up in a kind of started tomb, but now it's finished. Or they start the tomb and they realize the rock is not very good, or there are some water infiltration, so there are different uh, reasons for this. Okay, and my last point, very quickly, is uh, very interestingly, a, ro a, a construction site of a rocket tomb is also a quarry site. So, as somebody tells, I think in your introduction, Claudia, it's a, it's a subtractive technology, so you extract material 
And that's something I never thought about working in Sardinia. I never thought what, what, they, what they do with the stones afterwards. And here, actually, they would use the stones for different things, either simply to build a small platform at the entrance of the tomb. But all over the place, you will see retaining walls using the same block. So they would actually use this material for construction, not just in the cemetery, but even in the fields or in villages as well. Uh, other thing they would do is reuse the small chips that are used um, at some part in the construction project. And they would do lots of things uh, with it, but in particular, they would use it for revetments on, on roads, on path. And the key point here, which is interesting, is that you, you're free to use this kind of extraction material as you wish. For example, when we were talking to an artisan stone artisan working, there were this lady living in the neighborhood and she collected the chips of the stones to, for, for pavements. But once the tomb has been uh, inaugurated with the Masabu ritual, then everything is taboo, including the, the material that has been extracted. So after that point, you cannot reuse the, the small parts of the stones, which is in front. Okay, so, I'm still time. Right, okay, that's my last slide. So, um, so some key points. So the, the construction of a tomb in Tanata Raja is, is, is both technical and a ritual, uh, unsurprisingly thing, but uh, it's very tied up. So every step, you have a ritual and a technical steps. And the stone workers themselves uh, are not just here to perform the actual cutting of the rock, but they also perform the rituals. So they are also ritual agents in the, in the process. Tombs are also rock quarries, and as I said, the, the statue of the stone is changing across this project. So the tomb is just a hole, and there are just stones extracted. And after the consecration, the stones become something much more sacred or yeah taboo. And yeah, thank you. We are working with two very uh, nice and good guys, so I would like to thank them and thank you for your attention.